Hello there, hello there, and hello. Uh, this is going to be a quick review of the notes and then the review sheet itself. So make sure you find where the notes start as I'm going to fly through them in about three, two, one. So we started off the notes by talking about the history of the atom. Started off with Democritus. He was the one that came up with the idea and he said that uh, matter is made of tiny particles that can't be broken down. He called them atomos. From there, we jump to John Dalton and his atomic theory. He had uh, five theories that we reviewed about how atoms are the tiniest particle, that atoms that are identical are identical, atoms that are different are different, that they combine together to form compounds, and during reactions, they're rearranged. Then we showed off a bunch of pictures of John Dalton's different elect, uh, elemental symbols. J.J. Thompson, he's the guy that discovered the electron using the cathode ray tube. He did not discover the proton, but he assumed it must be there, because if there's a negative, there's probably a positive. Then we had Robert Millikan, who did further tests on the electron and was able to determine the charge of the electron, the value of the charge. Uh, that one's not actually true. J.J. Uh, Thompson is accredited with discovering the plum pudding model. Uh, he put the plum pudding model out there as the first model of the atom that included protons and electrons. He had the proton as this big positive area and electrons jammed into it. Ernest Rutherford carried out the gold foil experiment where he discovered the nucleus was a small, dense, positive charge. He shot positive particles called alpha particles at the, nucle at the gold foil and those that got reflected back were very few. Most of them went right through. And so he decided that the positive area must be very tiny. And about a dozen years after him, uh, James Chadwick discovered the neutron as the missing mass of the nucleus. And then we talked about the different models of the atom, how John Dalton thought they looked like a billiard ball. J.J. Thompson had the plum pudding model. Ernest Rutherford had the nuclear model with the nucleus. And then we talked about how elements are represented by symbols and subscripts tell us the ratio of the elements as they get put together. And superscripts represent the charges, whether they're positive or negative, is determined by looking at the sign on the number, on the symbol. Protons have a positive charge, not quite, but almost equal to the mass of a neutron found in the nucleus. Every periodic table says atomic number, but atomic number is actually number of protons. The neutrons are neutral. Uh, they have no charge then. They are also in the nucleus, slightly heavier than a proton, but just barely. They act like the glue that holds the nucleus together, but if you have too many or too few, the nucleus becomes instability, more on radioactivity in just a minute. Electrons are flying around the nucleus really, really fast. We're going to get a whole chapter on that later. The mass of an electron is way lighter than a proton or neutron, so they don't get factored into mass calculations. Isotopes. So we were just talking about how the neutrons can vary. Uh, this is one key equation you need to know. Mass number equals protons plus neutrons. So here we have a mass number for potassium written as a 40 on the top left. And here we have the name written out and a 40. Both of those tell us that potassium has a mass of 40 for this isotope of potassium. Not all isotopes of potassium are the same, but one thing all isotopes of potassium have in common would be their number of protons. You go to the periodic table, the atomic number says 19 for potassium, so it has 19 protons. However, the mass number hints at the number of neutrons. By subtracting the protons from the mass number, you can find the missing neutrons. And we practiced. We talked about isotopes and radioactivity and how sometimes uh, if the protons and neutrons aren't in balance, you can have various types of radioactivity. We talked about alpha, beta, and gamma radioactivity, that alpha was the safest, uh, beta not so much, gamma, oh my gosh, you're the Hulk. We also talked about half-life. Half-life is the amount of time it takes to lose half. Uh, the time is consistent. If you look at this graph, it takes five days to lose half of the original 80, and then another five days to go from 40 to 20, and another five days to go from 20 to 10. And that pattern goes on and on and on, and for the rest of that isotope's existence, it's going to lose half every five days. It will never actually achieve zero, but boy, will it get closer and closer and closer. Ions. Ions are where you gained or lost electrons. Only can gain or lose electrons, and that impacts the charge. If you lose something that's negative, your life becomes positive. 
The same thing is true with atoms. When atoms lose electrons, I said atom. When, <laughs> when atoms lose electrons, they gain a positive charge. When atoms gain electrons, they became a negative charge. And we talked about the terms cations and anions and how cations have a positive charge and anions are a negative ion. The periodic table. We talked about the different groups of the periodic table. The group one and two are the alkali and alkali earth metal. The halogens are the last group before the noble gases, and then the noble gases are the very last group. Uh, the groups always go up and down. Right to left, you have the periods, or horizontal, um, and they are numbered right down the side of most periodic tables, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Um, and the periods are going to be more important next chapter. We also talked about the division between metals and nonmetals, and that there's kind of like a zigzaggy line on most periodic tables that differentiate between the metals and nonmetals. And this is just a graph that shows solid, liquid, and gas. It's not terribly important to this particular unit. And this is the guy that got it all started. He's Dmitry Mendeleev. He put together the first periodic table looking at some trends or that it repeated themselves again and again and again. And these periodic rep repetitions led us to the periodic table. And let's go back to the worksheet. So this is the worksheet, the review sheet. Um, the review sheet talked about who did what. You had to match the people to what they did, and this we just talked about each of these different people. And then what is a cation and an anion? Cations are positive, because cats have paws. And then we had to number three, just write the formula based off of what was described. One phosphorus, three chlorines. Make sure that any time you are describing the number of each element, you use a subscript. You write the number below. It is not on the same line. It is below subscript. Number four, uh, how many protons and neutrons are contained in the nucleus of the following atoms? Let's make it clear. It says atoms, and since atoms are not ions by definition, they have no charge. So the protons and the electrons should be the same for every atom. Well, where are we going to get the protons for these weird old isotopes that are here? Uh, we're going to have to go to the periodic table. That's where you find the protons every single time. So 94 for plutonium, 95 for americium, 89 for actinium, 55 for cesium, 77 for iridium, and 25 for manganese. You just have to look on the periodic table. You're probably going to look at the periodic table 50 or 60 times during the test. Uh, how do I get the neutrons? Well, see right here on the top left? Top left has a mass number. That's 244. And that would be equal to the protons plus the neutrons. So how did they get 244? They did simple math. Well, they used a calculator, but it's not terrible math. So 244 is equal to the protons plus the neutrons. And they just subtracted the 94 protons out of the 244 and found the remaining neutrons. And then repeated the process for B, C, D, E, and F. Number five is pretty much the same thing. Again, the uh, top left is the atomic mass or mass number. Um, on the bottom left, you have the number of protons. Uh, sometimes those are written as A and Z, atomic number, and Z is the number of protons. Don't ask me why they picked Z. I guess Z was available or something like that. Um, just a second. I'm back. I'm sure you missed me during this two seconds. I have a pausing. Uh, number six has a statement about mass number versus average atomic mass. The mass number is the number of protons and neutrons in a specific element. Just like a minute ago, we were talking about these elements. Well, every single element that's up there is pretty radioactive, so there's a lot of different isotopes. So you could have a different number of neutrons. But when I look at the periodic table, I see one value for the mass, and that is called the average atomic mass where someone has gone and averaged all of those isotopes together. Number seven, Rutherford's gold foil experiment shot alpha particles, which are positive particles, at the gold foil, and most of the particles went through, showing that most of the space in the gold foil was empty space, and it went straight through, it didn't hit a nucleus or anything. Woohoo! Here we have a chart. Uh, we're filling in the number of protons, neutrons, and electrons carefully. Um, some of these did not have a charge on them. 
Let's just circle those. Like these guys didn't have a charge on them, so they're atoms. If they're atoms, then the atomic number, also known as the number of protons, and the number of electrons should match. However, uh, the ones that have a charge, like this potassium here, that's potassium plus one. So there's 19 protons and 18 electrons. If there's 18 electrons, there's fewer negative charges, which is why we have a total charge that's positive. And also, the mass number is the protons plus the neutrons. We've said that a couple times, but I'll write it down yet again. Mass number equals the protons plus the neutrons. So you are definitely going to need a calculator for this test, but it's just going to be one for doing mostly basic multiplication, addition, and subtraction. Nothing too crazy. I've gone into full announcer voice. I don't know if you noticed that I'm using full announcer voice. Full announcer voice only occurs in video form when I'm talking a little too fast. I apologize. Uh, number 9 and 10, back into announcer voice. Number 9, let's actually go to number 10 first. Number 10, we have the percentages and the masses of some sort of element. And so I'm trying to figure out what the average is. So this isn't a regular average because each of the elements is not in equal proportion. So we have to apply the percentage before we uh, find the average. So 48 times 32%, 49 times 12%, and 50 times 56%. Why is he dividing by 100? Well, because percentages add up to 100. So after we add these things together, we then divide by 100 to get what's called a weighted average. The last part is to always make sure that your answer makes sense. If you are averaging 48, 49, and 50, is that a possible answer? In my opinion, it certainly is. 49.24 is between the values given, so it could be a good estimate. Um, it's really easy to make a typo error on a question like this and go outside of the boundaries. All right, going back to number nine. Number nine, we have almost the same setup. I'm just going to circle this one and compare it. Look, we have a mass, we have a percentage, we have a mass, we have another percentage. There's not a third value because this particular element only has three isotopes, not, I mean, two isotopes. So if it only has two isotopes, then those two isotopes by themselves have to add up to 100%. If I had 40% of the cookies and Mrs. Hoffman had the rest, she would have 100 minus 40, also known as 60. So we set this up algebraically, and then we are careful with our math. Careful, we cross multiply, we distribute, we solve for x, move in slow motion through a question like this. Half-life, uh, so this is definitely a half-life question. It looks like it goes from 10 to 5. I'm just going to throw a 5 in there, and a little bit over 20 years. And then it goes from 5 to 2.5, and, and then it goes from 2.5, and, and it cuts in half. This takes a little bit more estimating than you probably want to do, but it is doable um, as long as your estimates are reasonable. Notice that for 9a, I'm looking for anything between 25 and 30 years for the half-life. Um, and then again, just an estimate. I'm not looking for exact values if the graph is hard to read like this one. And now we've reached the blank page where I draw my own self-portrait. Oh, no. No, that's not me. Um, but anyway, uh, hopefully you found this video to be uh, illuminating and getting you ready for the test. Uh, take a couple seconds. When everyone's finished up in a minute, uh, the sub's going to pass out the periodic tables and tests, and you guys are going to be on your way. Have a good day.